Hello, I'm Howard Stableford and welcome to Concept Cars. Some classic concepts, some brand new, but all pushing the frontiers of automotive design forward a little further. And I'm Adrian Bell, and between us we'll be your hosts for this series as we show you some incredible concepts on wheels. This is the Nissan Fuga. With an understated body style, what bystanders don't know is that when you slip into a dark tunnel, your interior turns into an intergalactic spacecraft. Wow! You can well say, wow, my man. With blue glows and high-tech iDrive type controls, you'd be tempted just to park up and play with all the knobs. Who wants to drive this thing anywhere? The star of the Tokyo Motor Show, the Fuga's stunning interior, incorporates tenets of modern Japanese design. The T-shaped center console and the door trim are decorated with unvarnished white cypress wood, which contrasts with black lacquer painted wood panels. Nice. Don't you love the way the green, pale leather seats are softly illuminated via the shades for the vertical moonroof panels, which are made of Japanese-style white paper? But if you did want to drive this thing and not just bask in its interior glory, we're told the Fuga adopts the FM, or front midship platform, that has been highly acclaimed on the Skyline for providing supple ride comfort. Oh, but who cares? Let's look at the sexy dash again. This is another design from Nissan's California Styling Center. It's called the Actic Concept. It's a sleek, bullet-shaped car with a versatile matching trailer with inflatable walls. So what's the point of this? A trailer's a trailer, isn't it? Howard, this is not really a trailer. Nissan intend this area to transform into a, quote, comfortable sleeping space for three. Comfortable? For three? Sometimes concept car designers aren't in the real world. If money's tight, you stay in a lodge or B&B. &B. If you love the outdoor life, you stay in a proper tent. Not a high-tech inflatable pancake. You know, though the concept car is actually very well designed, it has a long wheelbase and short overhangs, along with an extremely wide body and an unusually upright center body. With no pesky B-pillar to interfere, the Actic's wide doors provide easy access. But it gets better. The front doors actually move forward and the rear doors move backwards like lift doors. Uh, sorry, Adrian, elevator doors, creating open access for passengers and cargo. The Actic's smart door handles sense a pass of the hand and present themselves for instant operation. Very neat. Until they break down. Absolutely. A rear hatch gives additional access to the wide inner space, while the body itself kind of floats on a shock absorber mounted protective undersurface that cradles and helps protect the vehicle and its occupants. Overall, we like this concept, and if it's ever made, it could be a not too expensive option to boring saloons. In this, the final episode of Concept Cars, we thought we'd visit the car capital, Detroit, Michigan, to get an overview of some of the notable concepts through history. But first, we have to ask, why did Detroit end up as the main center of car manufacture? Detroit had a lot of advantages, actually, that it shared with a number of other American cities. It had good rail access, and it had water access, and it had a very, at, at the turn of the 19th century, it had a very diversified industrial economy. Another historian has summed it up very nicely. He said, more than any other American city, Detroit seemed to have people in it who would rather go broke building automobiles than get rich doing something else. In the early days, there were all sorts of strange concepts developed that were aimed at the rich as their next plaything. But in Detroit, there was a whole group of car designers who realized that motoring was really for the masses. The other thing that was one of Detroit's secrets was that these, most of these guys were attracted to the lower priced end of the market rather than the upper end. And that turns out, that's where the money was. That's where the mass market was. Ford was, of course, the king of mass production. But even though he used machinery as much as possible, his factories were still very labor intensive places. This famous mural in Detroit's Institute of Art gives us a flavor of what the early car factories were like. The very early uh, car plants were not really manufacturing plants, they were just assembly plants. Because what these guys did was they contracted everything out to all these machine shops and places that existed in Detroit and they just brought the parts together in a big open building and assembled them into cars. And they pretty much, they did it what they call station assembly. Ford revolutionized it when he developed over the course of a few years, developed their assembly line. The assembly line was a revolution, as workers had to do just one simple job all day. Rather than one crew moving from job to job, 
the jobs actually came to the people. The people stood stationary and the work flowed by and they had to keep up with the work. The problem Henry Ford encountered was that nobody wanted to do the work. And so what Ford did, thinking, if I pay people enough, they'll do almost anything. And he essentially doubled the wage for unskilled work, which is what most of the assembly line work was. Suddenly, this massive pay rise, which had to be copied by the other local factories, attracted the very best workers to Detroit, not just on the production line. Have a look at some of the astonishing concepts created over the years. Back in the 1930s, the idea of creating an expressive automobile to explore new worlds of design and technology may have seemed as fanciful as spaceflight. General Motors was the first manufacturer to take this step, and the result was the Buick Y-Job, a car that is widely acknowledged as the industry's first true concept car. This was the actual car driven by GM Vice President of Design Harley J. Earl through the streets of Gross Point, Michigan on sunny summer afternoons, just to get the reactions from the punters. Even if you don't like it, it's astonishingly different from anything else from the late 1930s. This is the X2000, a concept from the 1950s. Unbelievably, this promotional film from Ford is for real, when science fiction B-movies featuring cardboard spaceships were all in fashion. An enthusiastic Brit, Andy Saunders, actually built his own working version of the X2000 concept. Pretty wild. And in 1955, we had the astonishing Thunderbird, which developed from concept to production car very quickly, spurred on by the enormous enthusiasm of the American public. When this film was first shown on American flickering black and white screens, countless viewers would have had their tongues on the floor, astonished by the car's lines, and overwhelmed by an irresistible urge to save up and buy one. Then in 1958, at the General Motors Development Center, this curious concept car saw the light of day for the first time. Looking a bit like the Batmobile with its twin-domed roof, these gentlemen in white coats are about to show an amazed world, the Firebird 3. Here's Bob McLean, the styling engineer of General Motors in the late 50s, to tell us all about it. Firebird 3 is the third in a series of experimental cars we have helped design here at General Motors Styling. Firebird 1 was a high-performance vehicle and reflects the sweeping lines of a jet fighter. Firebird 2 was styled as a family car with additional engineering features. In designing Firebird 3, our job at Styling is to integrate the new developments of research and engineering into a fully operational, eye-appealing car. In 1958, they didn't have computer-aided design. The Firebird 3 was created with the use of um, cardboard cutouts. We start with a man, Oscar, and design the car around him. Basically, we need a passenger capsule and a power package. By putting a control stick here, at Oscar's side, we could develop a new means of entry and give Oscar a semi-reclining seat to put him in the most comfortable driving position. Today, the city of Detroit, particularly downtown, is a very shabby affair with block after block of derelict offices and factories. According to motoring historian Bob Casey, Detroit's huge success contributed to its eventual downfall. Detroit had created something the world had never seen before a low-skill but high-wage job. But Detroit was always looking for more productivity, and as you begin to get into, especially the 1960s and 1970s, Detroit found itself in the same position that, that American agriculture had been. At the turn of the century, half of Americans lived on farms. Today, about 3%. We haven't stopped growing food. We have just produced it much more efficiently. That's one of the things that's going on. We can produce these automobiles much more efficiently. With extra competition from more efficient car plants around the world, by the 1960s, the city lost its competitive advantage. Detroit, unfortunately, became a one industry town during its heyday. And as that one industry began to, to shrink for a whole variety of reasons, it meant the town began to shrink. This is the lovely city of Verona, Italy, the piece of the lane's beautiful architecture, history and charm at odds with the huge multi-lane motorways leading up to the outskirts of Verona. This part of Italy is particularly prone to quick-forming fog patches and because of this, accidents. But now technology is helping drivers stay safe on the roads thanks to a system pioneered by BMW and Reut's traffic systems. 
you'll know that as soon as there's an accident on a motorway, the vehicles that block the road behind it can cause more problems. We're talking not just the cars involved in the accident itself, but there's also a danger for the emergency services that have to attend the smash. Secondary accidents that are often more serious than the original can be avoided if the incident is detected immediately and the scene of the accident is cordoned off right away. That's what this companion system does being tested here in Italy. It's a warning system that automatically detects incidents and provides immediate warning to drivers. So how does it work? Well, there are loads of intelligent sensors and light beacons along the emergency lanes. The beacons are linked to a traffic computer center. There, an operator views any accident on a computer screen via the companion control graphical user interface. From the control center, the light units can be activated to flash warnings until the police arrive to cordon off the location. Well, there are two main parts of this system. Uh, one is visible to the driver and one is invisible. The driver sees, when approaching an incident, a blinking warning posts. And we found that he uh, reacts intuitively while reducing speed and uh, adjusting his speed to the overall traffic stream. The part which the driver does not see, but it's, however, is also important, is the incident detection and alarm management system. The stuff the driver doesn't see are all the inbuilt radar systems in each beacon, the inductive loops and TV cameras. The lights start flashing within seconds after the accident and they warn approaching traffic of problems downstream and invite them to slow down. In the future, active vehicle data, such as the crashed vehicle model, the car's speed at impact and even whether the car had its fog lamps on or off will also be transmitted anonymously to the beacons. Pretty smart, eh? Companion at the moment is the only a warning system which alerts and warns the driver uh, in a high, with a high spatial resolution in, real, in nearly real time. Finally, here's a clever twist. These beacons filled with high-tech electronics look ripe for nicking. Well, the beacons are protected against theft by a self-destruction mechanism. When a beacon is removed illegally, its electronics will automatically self-destruct. A missing beacon, however, does not cause a failure of the entire system, and the monitor in the control center immediately detects the problem, and no doubt send a signal out to PC Plod. Tests in the UK so far have included a stretch of motorway near Edinburgh, and the future looks bright for this roadside technology. Our expectations have been more than fulfilled. Uh, reduced speeds and more even traffic flow have been observed in all three sites. And there were no uh, negative side impacts, uh, such as uh, panic brakes or uh, things like this. It's time for the break, but let's have a look at some of the cars we'll be featuring in part two. Technologies that help drivers drive are always welcomed, but what about when it comes to park? Many manufacturers have pondered this over the years, and the rear parking sensors in many cars these days help you know how much space you have, but what if we took the technology one step further? The park assistance system has got ultrasonic sensors on the side of the car. The system is scanning the parking space. If the space is large enough, the driver has to stop the car and put in the reverse gear. The driver will control the braking and acceleration pedal. The car will control the steering angle in a way that the car is getting perfect in the parking space. Yes, here's a car which can steer itself into a space. If you don't believe me, have a look yourself. The X5 driver finds a space, judges it by eye that there is enough space, but switch on the new parking assistant on this special test car, and the onboard ultrasonic sensors not only measure the space, but gives the power steering all the information it needs for a perfect park. Look, Ma, no hands. Or as this is filmed in Germany, we should say, Look, Ma, no hands. But does this new technology mean that cars will soon drive themselves? The parking assistance system is not an automatic driving system. The system controls the steering angle while going backward in a parking lot. The driver has always the control about the whole car. We want to enhance the driving safety, driving efficiency and driving comfort. We must point out that the car doesn't fully complete the maneuver but just automatically operates the steering in reverse. It'd be interesting if you still smash into the car behind and blame the electronics on the insurance form and not your driving. 
Actually, what you could blame is the blooming annoying bleeps from all quarters putting you off. They'll have to make the bleeps less strident for any production version. And what about a concept paint job? It's been a tradition at BMW for many years to get a performance car from their range and give it to an artist for, well, let's say a makeover. The result you may love or hate, but at least the cars are a real unique work of art that becomes priceless. Some artists went to a lot of detailed work, and some, like Andy Warhol here, seem just to slap the old gloss on in a seemingly haphazard way. Here at the Retrospective Gallery in Augsburg, Germany, the public are about to see what happened to the classic 635 CSI when it was given to legendary artiste Erst Fuchs. The BMW Art Car Collection goes back to 1975 at the race at Le Mans, when the driver Hervé Poulain from France tried to create his car in a special way and he asked Alexander Calder to do that for him. This concept was followed by many other artists like Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein and many others like also Ernst Fuchs. However, all 15 BMW art cars are unique, are unique pieces of art, so unfortunately you cannot buy them. But we lend them to museums like the Louvre, like the Guggenheim or like the Hermitage in St. Petersburg and Russia whenever they need it to complete their collection, to complete an exhibition by artists or whatsoever. Now this is what I call a custom paint job, but I'd think twice about putting this car through a $2 car wash. In fact, I probably wouldn't drive it at all. This is the Luke Air Force Base in the heart of the Arizona desert. The U.S. military used this area to test and maintain their very latest jet fighters. We thought it'd be a great location for the ultimate showdown between two power machines. In the red corner, a specially adapted concept Dodge Viper, a powered up SRT-10, tuned and tweaked to absolute perfection. This is the 2003 Dodge Viper SRT-10. It's a 500 horsepower, all aluminum V10 motor. It's got 500 foot-pounds of torque, 505 cubic inches. In the blue corner, a fully fueled F-16 fighter jet, also called a Viper. It can pull 9 G's right up to the, the body's limit. It can go over twice the speed of sound, climb over 42,000 feet a minute. The Dodge Viper Club of America got together with Daimler Chrysler to challenge the U.S. Air Force. A flat-out race, a half mile long, to determine who had the best acceleration. Captain Glenn Richards is the pilot of the Viper with wings. I'm a captain in the Air Force and uh, I'm currently an uh, F-16 instructor pilot. His F-16 Viper is 50 foot long, has a 32 foot wingspan and has seven times the weight of the Viper car counterpart. The top speed is Mach 2, that's 1500 miles per hour. But can it accelerate faster than the Dodge Viper with a top speed of 190 miles per hour? Surely the car is far nimbler than the plane. The driver of the Dodge Viper is Herb Helbig. He's a test driver for Daimler Chrysler and the chief designer of the new Viper. My job is to make sure the car is developed to exceed the customer's expectations. Both Vipers get in position on adjacent runways. Flagmen are stationed at the quarter mile and half mile points, so we'll be able to see which Viper passes first. Herb in the Dodge warms up his tires so he has maximum traction. The control tower cues the countdown and they're off. The customized Dodge Viper takes off very fast and it easily beats the airplane Viper at the quarter mile mark. But as we get to the half mile point, it seems neck and neck. Then one of them, guess which, takes off. So who won at the half mile point? Freezing the tape and a bit of nifty calculation shows that the plane has it, but only by two tenths of a second over the Dodge Viper's 13.5 seconds. So what did it prove? Not much, but we had fun doing it. Our next concept car is a Nissan from the Japanese design studios. Even the internal cabin shape is taken from an oriental fan. And the hard chiseled lines at the front aren't just aerodynamic, but they're modeled on a traditional kabuki mask. The interior is inspired by Japanese elements such as ink paintings, cherry blossoms and wave-like patterns. Ergonomically designed by computer, stress-free seats provide comfortable interior roominess. Nissan tells us the seats are based on the concept of neutral posture. Apparently the seats recline to disperse an occupant's body pressure so as to avoid putting any strain on the lower back. The so-called Serenity concept is a fusion of sporty saloon and MPV. 
But the main area of thinking here has gone into the way the driver interface is set up. Many different functions are rooted into four basic buttons on the steering wheel. One, two, three, and four. It's called the 4HMI concept, where HMI stands for Human Machine Interface. Oh yeah, I heard about this, Howard. The 4HMI concept is like the holy grail for car designers. BMW started thinking about this and ended up with the iDrive system in the 5, 6, and 7 series cars, as well as the Rolls-Royce. What we're seeing here is Nissan's take on the ultimate human-machine interface, where everything is divided up into four, and so with the digital speedo, you get five little screens in front of you in what Nissan call the horizontal meter unit. Now, Nissan say this system offers, and I quote, stress-free, centralized control and the optimal and timely presentation of information to the driver. But in my opinion, there's a heck of a lot of information here that would distract the driver. So the dudes in the back can enjoy flip-down screens and headrest stereo. Shouldn't they control this rather than the driver? Good point, Howard. True to its name, the Serenity tries to combat the rigors of daily life, including commuting, we assume, by offering soft and pleasant design elements to the interior. This it succeeds in. Digital speedos and centrally placed info pods have made their way into modern cars without too many public riots. So if Nissan managed to introduce even just a few of these wacky features in production cars in the next few years, they'll be rolling the march of technology a little further forward, and that's good in our books. That's all from Concept Cars this week. We hope you've enjoyed the program. Join us again soon.